things that connect a fly fisherman with the water that have nothing to do with tackle. My dream was to discover what they were. So, on a fall day a few years ago, I packed my rods to follow the trail from creek to stream, from lake to river, from shoreline flat to deep ocean canyon. And what I found was that more than the fish I caught, what stuck in my mind like a number 14 hook were the few men and women who dissect water with the skill of a brain surgeon and understand that connection perfectly. Who are they? And what were their secrets? Follow me through the pages of my journal as I tell you about the legends of fly fishing. Surrounded by the mountains, woods, and farmlands of central Pennsylvania is State College. Besides being the home of Penn State's Nittany Lions, this community treasures the cool, crystalline purity of its nationally known trout streams. But streams have to be managed, their environment nurtured, they need people who care about their rare beauty, who have more patience than most, who passionately savor what lurks deep in their pools, runs, and riffles. So it's no wonder that besides zealously guarding the valuable resource of their fine trout streams, they're proud of a second treasure, a man who probably did more than most in turning people onto trout and the value of their environment. To him, a development of townhouses isn't half as valuable as a clean stream, a trico hatch, and wild browns lurking in the shadows of its bank. In Du Bois, Pennsylvania, where he grew up, they called him the Indian. A group of doctors would bring him out to their fishing camp where they'd play cards and send a young boy out to catch their limit of 25 trout each. He never disappointed them. But today, anybody who takes catching trout half seriously knows George Harvey as the Dean of Fly Fishing. And though he's taught 42 angling clinics and 72 extension classes in almost 70 cities and towns across the state, even more significant were the 30 years he spent teaching more than 36,000 students who took his two-credit course on fly fishing at Penn State. Still is the only course of its kind in the country. Higher education hasn't gotten around to making it a major, but give it a little time. Well, you don't just go knock on his door and ask one of the true legends of the sport to open up to you. George isn't that kind of guy. Even when they had him spread open on an operating table for a triple bypass, all they touched was his heart. But if you want to see a little bit of his soul, then you've got to talk to his best friend, Joe Humphreys. I must have been maybe 12 years old, 10 or 12. I'm just a tyke. And uh, I'm fishing a patch of, of Spring Creek uh, on the penitentiary grounds. It was called the Old Sawmill Stretch. It's in the evening now, and there was a great hatch. It must have been probably towards the end of May or middle of May, and there was a great hatch going on, and George was catching fish right and left. I didn't know who he was, but I was fishing a snelled wet fly. And the loop broke, and I couldn't fix it. And so I went to this gentleman, and I said, can you help me with this to get my fly back on this leader? And he says, son, I can't. But he says, see that guy up there? He says, that's George Harvey. And if you ask him, I'm sure he'll help you. So I went up, and I said, sir, can you help me with this? He had just landed a fish. The fish was feeding in a frenzy. He took the time and stopped to help me put this leader and fly back together. So he took the time for a kid. And ever since that time, he took his time for me. When George retired in 1970, he turned the course over to Joe, 
who ran it until he retired in 1989, and in the process, established a legendary reputation of his own as the best nymph fisherman in the country, a man who hunts trout with almost feral intensity. The coffee on, George. So when these two masters got together for coffee and donuts and stories, I was hoping I'd catch just one secret that would help me on the water. But what I heard told me more about these men than about trout. When you introduced me to that, that night fly, and I'll never forget that experience, you said, here, I'll let me show you a fly that's gonna, that can do it for you. This fly, if you learn to fish this fly at night, and you do it right, you're going to catch you're going to catch some good fish he revealed this secret to me because he could trust me and he knew that this would be a lever for me to even be better at night if i had that fly to use and he wanted to share it with me he was preparing me to take over the angling program at penn state i can remember the first time i tied that that big fly i came home that night and I decided I was going to tie a fly that would uh, cause some commotion in, in the water. Oh, it caused a commotion, all right. He tied a heavy body on a number four hook and ribbed it with hackle. Then, using stiff loon feathers, which were legal at the time, he created an abrupt front and wings that stuck out at the sides. I don't know how many casts I made, but this trout hit it and hooked himself. I finally got him back up and got him in the net and got him out onto the bank. And that was the biggest trout I had ever caught up to that time. And I caught it on that first night fly and it was 25 or 25 and a half inches long. But you and I kept that fly a secret for a long time. And I'll have to say this now, that there's quite a few things that I kept secret that, that I learned about fishing over the years that I'm ashamed to mention today because here I was teaching fishing and keeping some things that were uh, that helped me catch more fish than anybody else at the time and I imagine you did the same did thing the same, same thing. thing when George was a freshman at Penn State School of Agriculture in 1931 Dean Ralph Watts' favorite activity was fishing. George asked if he could go with him on opening day. The Dean said he usually fished alone. Well, that's okay, George said. I just want to ride to the stream, adding that he'd be fishing with flies he'd tied himself. The Dean said, well, I don't think you're going to have much luck. I walked down till I saw the Dean. And I said, how did you do, Dean? He said, oh, I caught two beautiful brook trout. And, uh, and he said, how did you do? And I said, well, I got my limit. He says, you what? I said, I caught my limit. And I took my basket and dumped these fish out. And they were all over 11 inches long, 12. And he said, I'll be Joe Dog. I never would have believed it. He said, I've never seen anything like it. He said, I fished this stream practically all my life, and I never saw a catch a trout like that. And I said, well, those aren't the big ones. And I reached in the back of my hunting coat and pulled out these five big trout over 18 inches. Well, the next year after that, in 1933, he said, you know, I've talked to so many people around uh, on the campus and in town and told them about the fly tying. And he said, there's a lot of them would like to learn to tie flies. If I get a class organized, will you teach it? And I said, yes, I'd be glad to. At 85, George isn't as sure-footed as he used to be. He can't wade the streams anymore. So Joe helps him find a level spot from which he can cast. But I know he must think about the days when he was the Indian swiftly moving from one slippery spot to the next until his cast on a perfect drift would tempt the next rise. He said to me when he brought me into Penn State to take over the angling program, he said, you owe it to your students to know every facet of this game, nymphing, dry flies, 
wet flies, every facet, day and night. This is the kind of a person he is. He's, he's there to help, he's there to lead, and he's done a wonderful job of it. He's taught thousands of people how to fish. But not only that, George was far beyond his time. He's an innovator. He took sections of leader and stuck them into beetles. He'd take a, a small portion of the leader. Uh, heavy diameters, like 15 thousandths. He'd stick it in a beetle and drop the beetle in the water and watch for these rising trout. And the, he found out that the leader didn't make any difference as long as he had a, an excellent drag-free float. To crack the secret of a drag-free float, George developed the slack leader cast, where the forward cast is checked sharply, allowing the leader to drop onto the water in a series of gentle curves. That's beautiful. Do you, do you kind of, you, you stop it abruptly up high, do you? Oh, that's nice. You can see that leader just come right down, can't you? You can just see it collapse. You stop it here and then drop it. Push down with this thumb when you make your forward cast. Right. Push down hard instead of holding it up in the okay. air. Okay, all right. Ever the teacher, George, even now, fine tunes Joe's cast. Push down with the thumb. Doesn't matter who you are. Even if you were once president of the United States, George will teach you. He was fishing the trico hatch on Spruce Creek when I showed up. But being the gracious gentleman that he is, Jimmy Carter was happy to set aside his rod and talk to me about George Harvey. We would uh, land at Camp David. Uh, all the news reporters would go to a bar or I guess a motel in uh, Maryland, we would change clothes, get back on the helicopter, and fly up here and land in this pasture. And George Harvey would meet us to give me and Rosen both um, kind of advanced uh, instruction on, on uh, casting technique. And then we would go to his house in State College and uh, watch him tie flies. He's one of the greatest uh, uh, fly tires in the world. And every time we came up here, I think we've been here maybe 19 or 20 times, he's always been here to share his flies with us and to give a few lessons after he observed our casting. So what kind of a teacher was George? George is a very patient teacher. He can watch you cast twice, and he knows exactly what to say. Why don't you just use your wrist a little bit more? Remember, you're just kind of like tacking a, a, a nail in the wall. Uh, don't strain, relax. So or if sometimes you're coming back too far and you don't stop at one o'clock. But the main thing is that he can look at a, at a student, size up the student's needs, and meet those needs in a very modest and uh, constructive way. So you don't feel embarrassed about making mistakes, you just feel grateful when you see the difference. In the world of expert fly fishing, sometimes what's on the line is not a fly, but something infinitely more delicate, an ego. Yet, in the few days I'd spent with George, it seemed to me he was made of sturdier stuff. I wondered if President Carter felt the same way. Some of the very famous fly fishermen who write the books and who design flies kind of take credit for things that others do. And uh, I hear them making little critical remarks of their so-called competitors. George doesn't do that. You know, George, if he designs a fly himself, and then a couple of years later he sees it in a, in a catalog being promoted as, as Bob's favorite this or that, you know, he just smiles and goes on because he's grateful to share, uh, you know, his knowledge and his design with other people. So I think the modesty and the generosity that George uh, exhibits has been one of the wonderful things that I've learned from him in addition to you know, how to fly fish and how to tie a fly. Earlier, when his grandson Joshua, who'd been fishing upstream, wandered over to find out whether his grandfather had any luck, President Carter was reminded of something that happened the day before. 
My 12-year-old grandson, Joshua, has become fascinated with fly tying. And so he's been using George Harvey's little book to learn how. And so we took Joshua out of school the last two days, as a matter of fact. Uh, he missed a Friday. He's going to have to miss a Monday. And uh, when George heard he was coming, George came over yesterday morning, got Joshua, and uh, I said, Joshua, would, would you rather fish? Uh, let Mr. Harvey show you how to tie flies. He said, I want to go with Mr. Harvey. So he spent yesterday at George Harvey's house where George was showing a 12-year-old kid, you know, how to tie flies. So I think this is uh, one of the reasons that George Harvey is an exceptional person. If George's reputation on the stream is legendary, what he does in this room has elevated him to the role of artist. He likes to tell people there's no other room like it anywhere in the world. And having seen it, and the thousands of fly tying materials he's got in it, I think he's right. A dry fly is a precise balance of measurements. Tail, wings, body, hackle, all have to harmonize exactly with the size of the hook. That kind of harmony can take years to perfect. George, of course, made it look easy as he tied his atoms. He may be a little shaky on the stream, but at the vise, his fingers are still steady enough to tie on a pair of wings faster than most men can describe it. Good and tight. And you pull them up in the air so they're... and wrap in front so that the wings will stand up. And you go in between them to make them stand apart. While George was dubbing the body of the atoms, I remembered asking him while we were on the stream if he had only four flies to use, which ones would they be? I would select an Adams, a Cahill, a Gordon Quill, and a Spruce Creek fly. And I would have them in sizes all the way from size 12 down to size 20 each one and if i had those four flies i could catch trout 90 percent of the time then we take a hold of the hackle and we try to keep it perpendicular i'd always agonized about positioning my hackle correctly and winding it perfectly perpendicular so when i watched george do it i was reminded of a great sleight of hand expert with over 70 years of experience and though I knew it wasn't magic, all I could think of was, how'd he do that? Well, George is a perfectionist uh, at the uh, at the fly tying bench or vice. Uh, every hackle has to be precise. The the weight of the fly on the hook has to be balanced so it'll float properly. It's uh, not only a, a, a work of art the way George does it. But with one of George's, say, 18 atoms or something like that, you can easily catch 30 fish before the fly is uh, gone or unrecognizable. Whereas if you buy the average fly in a shop, I'm not knocking them, if you catch three or four fish on a, on a fly, you can't even tell what it used to be. So I think that, that degree of perfection is what George does. I can't say that I've achieved it, but at least it's always a goal to be reached. Mm, that's a nice native. Though this Spruce Creek native fell to George's fly, there were a few others that got away. Yet up to a few years ago, it was almost inconceivable that any fish he'd set the hook on would escape. After all, George's reputation for winning the battle with any fish is legendary but he would also probably be the first one to tell you that nothing humbles a man faster than a trout. Joe remembers one opening day of trout season. 
It was kind of cold and the water was hot. And George chucked a nymph up in this foaming piece of water. It sunk deep. He had great line control and he hooked a fish that was awesome, a, a, a huge fish. It ripped out of that pool, screamed down through the next ripple and waved goodbye to George on its way by. And, and I'll never forget the look at his, uh, George's face when he came out of that pool. And he said, I never have one ever leave this pool that big. He says, when you hook a big fish in this pool, they always stay. And this one just, just cleaned me. And I thought it was so deep. George and I were discussing this and he said, I still have the excitement that when I picked up that, that rod when I was four years old and caught the first fish, and then when I was six uh, and caught more fish and maybe caught the first one on a fly, he said, I, I was trembling with excitement. He says, I've never lost that. And he says, today when I pick up a rod, I still have that excitement. And when I lose that, I'm gone. As I watched Joe help George wade the stream, it was easy to see the kind of devotion that many people don't understand in this day of hello, goodbye relationships. And I realized their most valuable secret was that the hundreds of hours they'd spent together on the water bound these two men in unspoken ways that went far beyond the deeper secrets of trout and the places they live. In the dark shadows under the bank, I've seen a trout that's as broad as my boot, with spots on his flank the size of poker chips. He's cagey and smart, but I think I'm smarter. If he wins, I'll be back to try him again. In the meantime, there's lots of water to cover and many more stories to share with you about the legends of fly fishing. See you on the water. <laughs>